Hello, everyone, and welcome to this AIM North America webinar on how electronic data capture supports traceability. I'm Mike Ellen. I will be moderating today's session. But before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items I'm going to go over. First is AIM's, AIM North America's antitrust policy. It's the policy of AIM North America to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM North America activity shall create even the appearance of a violation or the letter of the spirit of the antitrust laws. And then AIM North America's collaboration and work product policy. AIM North America committee meetings or webinars like today are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM North America has developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. And just a few more housekeeping notes. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. As a registrant, you will be notified when the recording is available. You will also have an opportunity to ask the experts at the conclusion of the presentation. To take part in this, please submit questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of the application screen. I'm pleased to welcome three industry experts today, and I will actually start by letting Colin Black from Metalcraft just go over a little bit about himself. Colin. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, good morning, everybody or I guess good afternoon, depending on when you're joining us. Um, my name is Colin Black. I'm the current RFID Business Development Director with Metalcraft, um, former, but prior to this role, I was our RFID engineer for a little over five years. Um, little about Metalcraft, we are a tag, and, tag label, and inlay manufacturer here in the United States, um, producing a variety of um, products and applications um, including custom inlay solutions, sensor inlays, any, anything um, more of a, a custom application in that regard. So glad to be here. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Jeannie Duckett. Thanks, Mike. My name's Jeannie Duckett, and I'm from Avery Dennison Systems. And at Avery Dennison, I'm in charge of looking at how standard development and interoperability propel uh, food traceability as well as other connected products forward. For those of you that don't know, Avery Dennison is a Fortune 500 company. Uh, we are the world's largest RFID manufacturer. But in addition to that, we also provide industrial printers and encode and decode points, as well as a connected product solution. And I'm very happy to be here today and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. And last but not least, Amanda Wade. Hello, nice to be here today. I am Amanda Wade. I am the Food Track and Trace Account Manager at Zebra. So I help uh, all of our account managers work with the supply chain with food. And I've been with Zebra since about 2016 and I started with the printers and now I moved into this role about a year ago. Um, Zebra is a large RFID manufacturer company. We make, um, RFID printers, RFID um, equipment, and, and RFID tags. We also are well known for a lot of our scanners or, and other um, track and trace equipment. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Amanda. And so let's get into it. Uh, we'll start with you, Jeannie. Uh, what does it mean when the FDA says tech-enabled traceability is core element one of the new era of Smarter Food Safety Blueprint? Yeah, thank you, Michael. So for those of you who may not be aware, there are actually four pillars to the new era of smarter food safety that was introduced in 2018. And core element one or tech enabled traceability really seeks to advance traceability to help protect consumers from contaminated products by doing rapid tracebacks, identifying the specific source and helping to remove those products quickly from the marketplace when necessary. Ultimately, the goal is to support end-to-end -end traceability throughout the food supply chain. The FDA is exploring ways to encourage firms to voluntarily adopt tracing technologies and ways to harmonize tracing activities, which will support interoperability across a variety of technology solutions, working towards outcomes that will be achievable for all members of the supply chain. Great, thank you, Jeannie. So continuing with you, how does technology enable regulatory compliance? That, that's a really good question, 
Mike, and you're, we're going to be hearing a lot more about this over the next coming years, because there's actually initiatives going on now in the United States, Australia, the EU, and South America. But RegTech, or technology that enables regulatory compliance, is simply a solution that achieves statutory compliance while enabling business process improvements. And the way this is achieved is by reducing the manual process of checking and verifying compliance. In the future, such solutions are going to assist with certification and government compliance inspections. Reducing this compliance burden can save millions of dollars for businesses annually, as well as governmental officials. The key benefits of these programs that different groups are trying to achieve is overall, it's anticipated that businesses are going to unlock up to $1 billion annually of value because they can now verify the claims of provenance, organicity, sustainability alone, in many cases, leveraging their reg tech or traceability systems. For example, one industry source suggests that the term grass-fed beef could lead to an additional 35 cents per pound to the primary producer and select markets. Another objective of this program is saving businesses annually by harmonizing traceability frameworks and leveraging regulatory technology to reduce those paper-based processes. And finally, reducing the economic, out, uh, um, economic uh, burden of outbreaks. For instance, we all remember the 2018 romaine lettuce outbreak. Recently, UC Davis released a paper that stated that processors and shippers lost $20 million in discarded inventory and another $38 million in unharvested fields and reduced demand. So just for processors and shippers, there was a $58 million loss from that one outbreak. Mike? Great, and Colin, I believe you, you just said you wanted to add something. Yeah, so looking at the question, I mean, I, I like to break things down coming, I guess, from my background, but looking at technology, understanding it makes our lives easier. And then looking at the regulations, regulations are only as good as the businesses that comply to them. So why, how does technology help us to regular, comply more regularly with all these regulations set in place? Well, Jeannie mentioned it, it is the ability to move away from manual data collection and entry and move more towards you know, that automated data capture. So an analogy that you can be made with this is looking at even some of like the newer technologies that are surfacing in our world, especially one of the ones that's very intriguing to me is, you know, AI technologies such as like chat GPT. I mean, the, for those who don't know a lot, I won't go into a lot of detail, but essentially chat GPT is your automated chat box that you can ask any question, type any question in the box, and it's going to use AI to search across the web and many different resources to get you the answer. And it's not just like, what's the weather outside? It could be very specific things for, you know, for instance, for like a computer programmer, they can type in, you know, write me a script in C sharp that's going to do this, this, and this, and it will spit that out in a matter of seconds. I mean, it's very cool technology. So how does that, you know, relate to our discussions here today? Well, I use the analogy of students and this whole chat GPT and how they're going to eventually go away from, students are not going to need to know how to format their research papers in MLA or APA format anymore because that's gonna automatically be done for them. They're not gonna to need to know where to put commas in their sentences because it's going to be done for them. So what does that mean? It's gonna allow students to shift their mindsets away from some of those technical things or more manual things and focus on how can I use these tools to best communicate the message or in our case, the data that we're collecting. How do we best utilize that data? And I think ultimately that's what technology is going to allow us to do in some more of the, the regulatory compliance standpoint. Very interesting. And so since AIDC is a pioneer in helping establish compliance, what are the operational efficiencies enabled by AIDC for a sustainable supply chain? And Jeannie, I'll go with you for this one. 
Well, thanks, Mike. And, and kind of like what Colin was just talking about, he was talking about this concept of the, you know, the formatting or the manual check boxes and all those processes to collect the data so that we can focus on the data itself. And one of the things that are gonna power these artificial intelligence and le machine learning um, systems is accurate data. And RFID superpower is the collection of accurate data rapidly with minimum inter uh, interaction with uh, you know, your staff members. And, and there was a really interesting study highlighting this a couple of years ago at the University of Auburn. The University of Auburn examined the flow of product information between eight brand owners and five retailers over a one year period from June, 2017 to July, 2018. And the participants in the data exchange used RFID technology to track, tag and share item level inventory from the point of manufacturer to the retail outlet and the distribution center. The results of the studies really demonstrate the power of accurate data, accurate and fresh data. The results of this study showed that item level visibility raised inventory accuracy so that ability to make decisions based upon having viable inventory data from 63% to 95%. It reduced out of stocks by up to 50%. And most importantly, it cut that count of that cycle count time by 96%, allowing you to focus on the value of the data and leverage it to improve your business outcomes. In fact, what they found and discovered in this study that the cost of the RFID tags, the cost of the RFID tags and the read points were less than the cost of inaccurate shipments. So that really does an indication on the power of having accurate data through AIDC or automatic identification and data capture technologies. Mike? Great, thank you. Uh, I do believe Colin had something to add to as well. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Jeannie hit the nail on the head when it comes to data and the power of accurate data. And I think ultimately, you know, operational, how to make, what defines an operation as being efficient? It's when you're getting a consistent result that's meeting your expectations. And so what with AIDC, and especially when we're looking at sustainability across the supply chain, especially in the food industry, it's a lot of times it's understanding what are the issues that are popping up throughout the supply chain that are preventing us from having those consistent results. So, you know, by not utilizing AIDC technologies, you know, businesses in the past may have had to rely on guessing you know, on, you know, trying to think of situations where there's food waste and they had to guess or use anecdotal information and data to make business decisions to improve their processes for efficiency. So by having, and for, let's just go into an example. For instance, you know, are they seeing, are businesses seeing food waste because of lack of moisture in the fields which results in a lack of yield from the field when it comes to harvest time. Is that an inch, it, a reason for why they're seeing food waste or food shortages? You know, or is it you know spoilage of a pallet that's being transported in a truck that reached undesirable temperatures in that truck, therefore that food product is no longer usable and valid? Those are types of data and information that can be transmitted through AIDC technology that otherwise wouldn't have been there before. And we would have had to find out the hard way, like Jeannie mentioned earlier about the, the spoilage of all the romaine lettuce. You know, they didn't know how to, which lettuce was bad specifically at the item level as Jeannie mentioned. So they had to say, hey, all romaine lettuce is bad. If you have it, don't use it. I mean, that's not a very good and effective way of tracking the products. So using these, you know, having these item tagged products allows us to make those decisions and catch some of those issues far enough in advance. You know, Colin, those, you bring up some really good points with the romaine lettuce outbreak and the fact that the growers and distributors lost $60 million in value. But that, that's across, you know, uh, you know, an industry. 
to bring that down to us, uh, uh, you know, more of a retail level, whether it's a retail grocery or the back of a restaurant where you have, um, you know, one of your employees probably employed either in high school or college, and they're going out and manually looking at date codes and trying to do an accurate manual count. A lot of times still up with paper and clipboard versus just accurately uh, collecting your current inventory and what your current product viability is. And then you use that uh, employee to either interact with your customers or perform other value added services for your business. Great, thank you guys for that. And so, Amanda, are utilizing AIDC technologies really worth it? Yes, I think uh, you both mentioned it, both Colin and Jeannie, um, $58 million in lettuce is a lot of money and a lot of lettuce. And I like a couple of Jeannie's stats, 63% accuracy to 95% inventory accuracy. When retailers can um, gain that type of accuracy, the ROI is easy to prove. So utilizing these technologies will be worth it. Um, you can correct out of stocks by 50% and cycle count time. We've seen this in some POCs, 96% is huge for cycle count because cycle count is done by what you were just saying by labor and labor is expensive and labor is hard to find, which we'll address in a minute. But yes, most definitely it's worth it. Um, 20 years ago, everyone who looked at RFID thought it was a, the greatest thing, and it's a great solution for tracking and tracing many different items through the supply chain in the store, but the ROI always held us back. And to roll out any type of big solution like this, um, you're going to need ROI. Your finance people are going to not let you buy it or implement it unless their ROI is there. So um, now what I've seen, the ROIs, that they are double digit ROIs on a lot of the implementations we're doing. So I'm just going to talk about the elephant in the room and its cost. Uh, 20 years ago, everyone said, bring a tag down to five cents, we'll roll it out. Or if the tag was five cents, we could do this. We can't do it when it's a dollar tag. Well, I'll tell you right now, you can get a five cent RFID tag. And yes, there are many, many different types of tags or, or labels. So we have what I'm talking about is a logistic label. A lot of the POCs, proof of concepts we're doing, um, the supplier guides I've seen, there's a logistics tag. It's pretty simple. It's a thermal um, user readable basic tag. Um, it's not like a high heat tag or a, a special on metal tag. It's your basic logistic tag. But if you work with your purchasing group and they work with your label supplier, and you work the label, the converter, the label supplier, they have programs like make and holds or blanket orders where you can buy in bulk and get the five cent tag. And with the amount of volume you'll be doing um, in this food supply chain, if you're tagging each case, uh, you'll be able to get this kind of discount. So the 5%, the five cent label should not be the hindrance anymore. And what you'll see is I saw where Ann had mentioned that um, it shouldn't cost anybody anything. I, the return on investment, the amount of labor savings you'll get um, will offset anything you spend on the labels or the um, equipment, depending on how in-depth of a solution you roll out. Um, but also the other thing, it's not just the cost because the price per label, but over the last 20 years, the accuracy and um, the readability, the read range, the longevity of the tag itself and the equipment has grown by leaps and bounds. Um, a lot of that has to do with the actual inlay inside the label and the chip in the inlay. And I was going to let Colin talk a little bit about that, but definitely I think it's worth it. Yeah, thanks Amanda. You know, I love this question because it's so loaded and open-ended, but I mean, the short answer is obviously yes, but especially where we're at here in 2023, I mean, I've heard this said and I completely agree with it. And I think it's something that is very much true and evident today, especially with RFID technology is we're no longer at the point of having to prove that RFID technology works. That was a huge hurdle way, you know, back in the you know early 2000s, mid 2000s, but we're past the point of having to prove that RFID works. And now it's just 
understanding and identifying how it's going to work in your system. And that is, you know, Amanda talked about many different ways that you can, you know, utilize it because of the, the boost in performance that we're seeing in tags. You know, she, she mentioned, you know, some of the costs. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I plan on touching, you know, on some of the, the chip tech. I think it might be one of the later questions here. I don't know. What is our next question, Mike? Yeah, sorry. I think it is a little bit later. Yeah, that's all right. That's that's all right. right. <laughs> I got ahead of myself. Nope, that's good. Great. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate that. And uh, going back to you, Amanda, uh, you did explain some of the prior issues and the changes. So why now are customers utilizing AIDC? Well, I mean, I hate to even say the word, but after the pandemic, you know, in the, in the labor shortages, um, I work with customers from the quick serve restaurants, retail, all the way back to the farm and the fields and everything in between distribution, manufacturing, and everyone does have a labor shortage issue. And labor is one of the most expensive things on your pay on the book. So um, why now? It's because the way RFID works, it's a frictionless, uh, automatic way to monitor what comes and goes out of your facility. There's no labor needed. Um, so let's say, I, I think a lot of you know what RFID is, but in case you don't, real quick, if you have a, a case full, a pallet full of 20 cases coming in your dock door, we can put um, a portal around your dock door or an overhead reader. And as the cases come through, it automatically reads it and it's reliable, it's accurate. There's no one there that has to scan all 20 cases. Uh, it will be just as it moves through, it will be uploaded into the system. So there's no human intervention. And I think um, in, an, in the facility, also a couple other ways for RFID to work that we're seeing put into places, overhead readers in a large warehouse. At any time, they, you could do a read and see what's there. Um, without human intervention or someone going to a shelf to see what's there. And with FISMA 204 coming out, expiration date and lock codes, if we have to do a callback because of um, some bad lettuce, we will know the traceability lock codes. We The overhead readers can tell somebody to go pull that off the shelves and we'll be a lot more targeted with a, a lot less human inter intervention. And what I see with like an Amazon or UPS and UPS on their investor call mentioned this, that just the sure volume of what's being shipped nowadays, uh, the packages, you have to automate. And I know UPS announced they were putting in RFID in many of their facilities to help with efficiencies and automation because they also have labor issues. So we're seeing RFID go well beyond apparel now. We're seeing it in the um, home goods space. We're seeing it in sporting goods, we're seeing it in tools. So I think we'll be seeing a lot more of it also in food just because of all the savings and the labor issues we're having. You know, Amanda, you bring up a really good point that you're now starting to see RFID in multiple industry verticals. Another thing that's enabling it other than RFID superpower of frictionless accurate data capture is just the enablement of standards. So there's the old saying, rising tide raises all boats. As we adopt more and more standard ways of handling data, the infrastructure and the rollout times are becoming shorter and easier for businesses to adopt. Yeah, one comment I'll add on this, this comment. I mean, you know, we asked the question, why are people using the technology now versus, you know, five, 10 years ago? Um, Amanda already alluded to like pricing and how that's a big you know, factor in a lot of business decisions, which it should be. I mean, there's, I mean, that hits the straight, the bottom line of, you know, the cost to implement some of these technologies can be expensive, especially, you know, depending on the size of your business. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I attending many, you know, industry trade shows, especially around RFID, I swear every company sends one employee to these trade shows and says, hey, what's the cost of RFID now? You know, I mean, I hear that question every single time I go to a trade show which costs are going down, which is a great thing to see. You know, there is some fluctuation due to, you know, economic times, but it's important to look at long-term effects of the technology. In this case, RFID, 
And the, the specific category of that I'm going to focus on is chips and how chip technologies are in the grand scheme of things coming down in a manufacturing cost. And so why is that you're probably asking is one chips are getting smaller in size, you know, their chip manufacturers are very much, you know, focused on bringing a smaller chip to these inlays, not only that, but these chips are increasing in their sensitivity which means they need less power from the reader in order to transmit back or backscatter a response. That allows for boost in read range because you need less reader power to, to fully power that RFID tag. Um, so now you're looking at boost in performance, smaller chips, and because those chips are smaller in size, the process for manufacturing inlays, these Raw, these raw RFID chips come on wafers, which were historically eight inches in diameter. Well, in the last few years, the chip manufacturers have gone to larger 12 inch wafers, which with smaller chips now going in a bigger wafer, you're allowed for a lot more chips to fit inside of those. Some of the numbers go from, you know, in years past, we're looking at 50 to 75,000 chips per wafer. Now some chip manufacturers are going over 500,000 chips on a wafer. So the amount of throughput that you're getting from these types of process allows for prices to come down from a, a tag manufacturer standpoint. And ultimately that cost can get carried over to the end users. Thank you, Colin. So Jeannie, we talked about the customers, but what are the roles of the manufacturer, distributor, and the operators or grocers in this whole process? So um, basically everybody in the supply chain uh, from the primary producers through to the retail outlet through processors, distribution, warehousing, all have basic needs that they need to meet. They all have to be able to count their product and have that critical, uh, that those key data elements about that product known, such as the lot number, the relevant date, and some other key data elements. And then now they're all starting to capture what's called critical tracking events to build their vision of the supply chain so that they know who they're going to and where they came from. But the real reason, so those are the regulatory reasons why interest is growing into this. As Amanda mentioned a little while ago, uh, you know, another elephant in the room, the pandemic, uh, really showed us the vulnerability of our supply chains globally, as a matter of fact. And there's, let's look into a little reasons why that exists. In 2016, the World Watch Institute in DC conducted a study that showed that food now travels between 1,500 and 2,500 miles from farm to table in the United States. And this is 25% further than it did in 1995. This number is not surprising when you look at the gross weight of food that's transported by ocean has increased 200% since 1980. So this study conjectured that the lengthening of the supply chain increases vulnerability to supply chain disruptions, such as transportation issues, terrorism, or labor strike, or as we found out, global pandemics. Uh, this vulnerability is not limited to the United States, however. In the UK, food now travels 50% further than it did in 2000. So with these longer entangled food webs, it's becoming increasingly difficult to understand where exactly your food came from and what confidence you can have in your certificate and nutritional allergen statements. So traceability helps make much of what's currently invisible within our food systems visible. It could potentially facilitate comprehensive tracking of environmental, economic, health, and social constants of different production processes and make it possible to calculate the true cost of food. And it also enables meeting that growing consumer demand for transparency. In addition, producers, including small scale producers looking to harness potential efficiencies brought on by these technologies that we were talking about, those labor savings and this enabled transparency, such as cost savings and, and get those higher benefits through sustainable proved claims. So traceability can help producer revenue, market access, and affordable access to capital. So Mike, in answer to your question, who wants to do this? Basically everybody does. Regulators, we talked about the emerging right tech industry earlier in this. Uh, we touched on how hard it is 
but you know, consider that warning that we did in the FDA in 2018, where the FDA released a statement, you know, we don't know where your food came from, just don't eat romaine lettuce. But the one that's talked about left that I like even more, and I don't know if anybody remembers this, is the next one that came. Okay, guys, it's now safe to eat romaine lettuce, but make sure you check that growing region where it came from. You know, and until I got into food traceability, I swear to God, I never heard of Salinas and Yuma. Uh, food safety professionals, they want to, you know, do supply chain traceability because it helps you isolate that lot of suspected food and enables compliance with global regulations and corporate initiatives such as GFSI and Codex. Supply chain professionals, the ability to know what inventory you have, what its status is, where it's at, how it's tracked is key to managing an efficient supply chain. And operational professionals, as Amanda brought up, you minimize that amount of time back a house to do stop picks and reorders. Increased visibility to the real-time product status such as expiration date and recall status. And finally, consumers. Consumers do care about sustainability and they're backing it up with their wallets. Just last week, Nielsen and McKenzie released a report in February of 2023 that showed over the last five years that brands that have uh, what consumers view as verifiable claims grew at a faster rate and had a larger gross margin than brands that didn't. I encourage you to go out and take a look at the report. Uh, Mike? Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, Colin, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah. So, I mean, I, Jeannie makes a lot of good comments there with a lot of statistics, which is always really good to understand, you know, what is the role of manufacturers and distributors in, you know, ultimately allows end users and grocers to use this type of technology and process. And Ultimately, the way I look at it is as manufacturers, solution providers, it's our goal to make adoption of this type of technology as simple as possible. And not only that, but it's our job to show the proper practices in the best way to utilize the technology. So, and this also includes how do we set up these end users to play well with others? Because part of the thing with RFID is everyone uses their own RFID, if everyone uses RFID and their own proprietary system so that they can manage their own, you know, business within their four walls, that's great, but we're going to have a supply chain disaster because now all of a sudden we're reading millions and millions of RFID tags, capturing millions of numbers and data, and we have absolutely no way to decode that information and make any sense of it. You know, many of the other industries and, you know, uh, groups in the world call that tag clutter, number clutter. It's it's a term that means, you know, num when you capture RFID data and you have no idea what it means. I mean, there's there's no sense of that. There's no reason in doing that. So as tag manufacturer solution providers, it's best that we help guide the end users into standards that are set up by organizations like GS1, the RAIN Alliance. There's numbering systems that have Groups have put a lot of work and a lot of effort into to, in, to make it easy. It should make it easy. You know, people a lot of times look at standards like, oh, why can't I just, you know, slap a numeric number on it and call it a day? Well, that might be easy up front and it might allow you to get that one task done. But in the long term, it's not going to give you the ROI you're looking for. It's not going to make, you know, everything simple because you're going to have lost product and ultimately it's going to make a mess of our supply chain. And one thing I'd like to add from a manufacturer, and I mean, we all work together in this industry. Some people think we're competitors, but behind the curtain, we are all working together to make sure RFID is in, interoperable between all of our equipment, our gear, our tags. So we, all three of us are on different work groups and industry groups together. And just know that the manufacturers behind the scenes are working together to make it a seamless technology. Great, thank you for saying that, Amanda. That's a very important point. So Jeannie, what is AIDC's impact on market access for food traceability? So I think we've been talking a little bit about AIDC's impact on um, market access for food traceability. So you have that reduction in cost for your supply chain members. 
your operation people are spending less hands-on labor and they're collecting more accurate data that can go to drive those data models that Colin was talking about. Once again, your big data, your artificial intelligent models really are gonna rely on accurate data. And then it can facilitate with your supply chain, knowing what product you have, where it is, what the state is. It leads into operational efficiencies as far as manufacturing your next production runs. Do I need to make this product or do I need to chop this uh, lettuce? Do I need to you know, ground this meat? Is there gonna be a demand for it? Because you now have accurate visibility to what your existing inventory is. And then uh, as far as regulatory compliance, uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, in this country as well as other countries that if all these regulatory compliance initiatives can get aligned, that's going to lower the cost of doing business. And I'll just share a brief case with you. I was at a seafood supplier and they asked me how many times in a year they thought that they were audited. And I, you know, I thought I was going to go this big, I guess 10. <laughs> and I thought that was a lot of time for one supplier to be audited one year. Turns out that this supplier is audited 256 times and they have a staff of three people just to maintain the audits. And you think, oh my God, Jeannie, why are they audited so much? And I asked them that question. And apparently they're audited by everybody in the sun. They're audited by brand owners that were trying to get confidence in the data. Uh, they're audited by multiple regulatory governments around the world. They're off, um, uh, they're audited by other supply chain members, such as processors. And what I was listening to these guys talk and I was like, you know, at the end of the day, the reason why these people are audited so much is there's no confidence in the data. So everybody has to go out themselves to look at this person's process to ensure to them they're meeting that. But if you can build that regulatory compliance in through RegTech, you can build that confidence in the process. This person for sure is gonna be able to lower their cost of how much these audits are uh, costing to their bottom line. Thank you, Jeannie. So Jeannie just mentioned reg tech. We talked interoperability. So let's let's get into standards. Uh, Colin, what is TAG Data Standard 2.0? How much time do I have, Michael? <laughs> I'm just, so for those who, who are aware, we've mentioned GS1 a couple different times in this um, webinar. And GS1 is a standards organization. And one of the latest standards that they put out is their TAG Data Standard 2.0. Um, it's a 370 some page document. So if you are interested in some light reading, jump out on the web and you can check that out. But I will break it down into some of the, the main points that um, I've taken away. And a lot of this can be brought out from you know, some of the intro paragraphs from the document. So some of this stuff I am um, pretty much quoting verbatim, but um, it's a good understanding if you have more technical questions and in-depth questions around the standards. But ultimately, the TAG data standard is about defining, defining two things. It's the electronic product code, the EPC. And that's the first thing because the EPC is essentially just a universal identifier that describes a physical object. So it's, it's assigning what is that EPC number for any physical object. And then the second part of that is understanding the RFID data that's gonna be encoded into the tag. So there's two different things there, the EPC and the RFID. Some of the key points between those two, and it's important that EPC and RFID are not always synonymous. And the reason for that is, is an EPC is an identifier, whereas RFID is a data carrier. So understanding the difference there and why there's sometimes a misconception or um, why people confuse that is because UHF or RAIN RFID, inside those chips, there is a memory bank referred to as the EPC. So sometimes that can be confusing that, oh, EPC is RFID. Well, there is a memory bank referred to that as, and that is where you can store the electronic product code, but that memory bank doesn't always store the actual EPC of the product that you're looking, the physical product that you're looking to track. 
So a couple last points I want to make is, so GS1 has generated many different numbering systems to identify the variety of EPCs, the electronic product codes, for many different applications. To name a few, there is the GTIN, the Global Trade Item Number. That is a numbering system that identifies products and services. You have the GRAI, that is a Global Returnable Asset Identifier. That identifies pallets, cases, crates. So there's, and there's a few others. There's SSCC, which are logistical units. There's GIAI, which are assets. There, if you go on GS1's website, there's many different numbering systems that ultimately will fit whatever product or item that you are looking to tag. So I encourage everyone to get out there and look at that or contact a tag label supplier, label expert, and they can help guide you to the correct numbering system. Um, it, the beauty is, and I'll close with this, that you know, sometimes there can be all these different numbering systems, but you look at them and you're like, you know, I don't really think that my product or item really fits into any of these. That's where there's other numbering systems and other standards out there, ISO, as well as the RAIN Alliance has their numbering system, which is kind of a, a catch-all to where if your item doesn't fit into any of these GS1 standards, you can turn to other standards organizations like the RAIN Alliance for UHF tags, RAIN tags, and then they will have a number that you can still submit for and get to make sure that you're complying with regulations so that your products can be globally identified throughout the supply chain. Thank you for that breakdown, Colin. And then how is AIDC's role changing in this whole space? And Jeannie, I'll let you answer that one. Well, thank you for one of the things Colin hit upon is I think we're having this growing awareness that there's a difference between a data identity and a data carrier and that data identities, as Colin mentioned, should be globally unique. Whenever you're setting up a, a data system for your business, it's really easy to think that I could just go ahead and assign numbers to my products. So one of the examples I use a lot is I, I grow apples and I assign one, two, three to my apples and Colin grows potatoes and Colin assigns one, two, three potatoes. Now I know I'm talking about apples and Colin certainly knows he's talking about potatoes, but once you get out into the digital supply chain, it becomes a lot less clear. That's why I sign it like what Colin said, you know, contacting your standards body, using a global unique identity can help you leverage your technology and your investment in technology. The other thing that's interesting that's emerging is this whole concept of serialization. Back in 2018, the pharmaceutical industry has been on this path for serialization for over 10 years now. So back in 2018, the pharma industry predicted that serialization would be coming to food. And that was definitely a very forward looking viewpoint. But I, you know, doing some research in this, one of the pioneers in item level serialization were the milk producers in China. And they used serialization in a QR code on the container to comply with regulations uh, to prevent fraud. The QR code provided authenticity and information on the consumer behavior, efficiencies of the distribution network, and provided data for production, forecasting, marketing, and new product development. So in the end, the regulatory compliance of serializing the milk enabled one Chinese producer gain market share from 7% in 2017 to 21% in 2022. Now they have the trust of the Chinese consumer enabled by their serialization, showing that they had both provenance information for where the product was produced, as well as traceability information showing how it flowed through the supply chain. Building on standards, the, uh, on this concept of standards and what this interoperability that we've been talking about today can leverage, the Boston Consulting Group released a study that said the average food item in the United States as it's traveling along those 1,500 miles tracks through five business IT systems with siloed data that are non-interoperable. And that's not including the Excel spreadsheet. So what's the challenge with this? The challenge is, is if I have five non-interoperable systems, 
certainly someone is inputting that data into that system, someone's receiving that data. That takes introduces the potential for error as well as takes manpower to do it. So these things are really helping us grow our understanding of AIDC in the marketplace and how it really enables these business process efficiencies. Great, thank you, Jeannie. So I'm gonna get right into questions and comments. Uh, we do have a lot of questions and comments here. So uh, I'm just gonna start out with Amanda. Uh, first question I have is, can QSRs really expect to su suppliers to RFID tag all of their cases? Yes, I would say they can, especially with the FISMA compliance coming up. Um, there are QSRs already doing this. Okay, great. Uh, another question we have is RFID tags on pellets and cases make sense now. When do we anticipate or do we anticipate RFID tags on individual items like a head of lettuce, individual apples uh, for scanning at the point of sale? So I, I can jump in here. We're starting to see, and I think you're going to see actually here in the United States and once again globally, this concept of serialization on individual products so you can drive that value all the way back to source. Um, that's being enabled both by barcodes and RFID tags. And yes, there are people currently piloting and looking at using RFID on item level food products. Great. And another question we have is what initiatives are addressing accurate data on practices at the pro producer level? Well, there's two, really. We're talking, all of us today, Amanda brought it up, um, you know, the industry's participation in standards groups, such as AIM, such as the GS1, such as the RAIN Alliance, such as ISO standards, you know, the participation in standards group to define that common language and common understanding. And um, that's really propelling things forward, as well as, you know, getting uh, use cases out there and case studies showing the value of how individual people actually realize these benefits. Okay, another question we have is, can tags like RFID uh, be reused, reissued by other vendors, parties, by reloading information on the product packed in cases? And if so, what is the effort involved from suppliers to do so? That's really a supply chain decision. So RFID tags, in addition to their rapid capture of accurate data that's going to fuel our data analysis that we're talking about. Another one is it is one of the, it's not the only one, but it is one of the rewritable data carrier technologies out there. The reason I said that this depends on your supply chain is a lot of supply chains uh, for provenance and security reasons that we're discussing. Uh, promote the concept of locking that tag so the tag cannot be modified. But even within that context, uh, Colin brought up the concept of, of the EPC memory bank. There's also a user memory bank. There's other memory banks on an RFID chip. So the potential exists to lock one memory bank while leaving the other one available for another supply chain member to write to. I can add a <clears throat> comments on that as well. So the beauty, I mean, RFID obviously is, I mean, is growing in popularity as well as just overall performance efficiency and accuracy ultimately. But one of the things that, I mean, even as an RFID tag and label manufacturer, we always recommend that you pair RFID with other AIDC technologies as well. It's, you know, it as great as it would be to just put, you know, embed an RFID tag in something and that's all you're relying on. That can be effective and it's it's been effective for many you know um users depending on what application they're using but if you're looking at tagging items typically a great partner of rfid is the the humble barcode i mean pairing a barcode with the rfid data that you're looking as a backup in the case that potentially the rfid does fail and so in the case of reusing tags you know if you go with that route the barcode is typically static, so you're not going to be able to change that. And then does that bring up 
you know, difficulties in reprogramming a tag potentially, but that's not an answer. I'm not saying no, but there's, depending on how you're using RFID technology and these others, you know, you may need to assess the best, that process ahead of time before you start to look at, you know, re-encoding tags. Certainly work with your trading partners to determine what's going to work in your supply chain. Great, thanks guys. And so another question revolving around standards, uh, in terms of the standards being adopted in the market, are they being receptive to things like TDS 2.0, EPCIS and other initiatives? Yeah, I can start that and then I, I think Jeannie, you probably got some comments on this as well. So I think like most you know, standards, uh, especially newer standards, when there is a change to a standard, there is kind of a lag period to where you'll see, you know, you know, the adoption of the newest iteration to the standard. Um, but the one thing I will say is the more that users are being pushed in the direction of standards from suppliers, or sorry, from manufacturers and solution providers, the quicker that adoption is going to be. And so, frankly, I think it is really more on the, the hands of the, the tag suppliers to be pushing that first first and forefront so that we're not relying on end users to have done an extensive amount of homework up front to say, hey, I need to use tag data standard 2.0. It should be something that is just delivered to them. And then they understand that, yes, I'm compliant with the tags that I'm purchasing because that's the way my supplier pushed me in that direction. Yeah, that's a good point uh, for the role of, you know, the solution providers and the uh, original equipment manufacturers have in this. There has been a lot of standards released in the last 18 months, as uh, the question indicated, EPCIS 2.0, PEG Data Standard 2.0, and you'll see an evolution and move to them. But the really exciting thing about these standards is there's a considerable amount of work being put in the ecosystem to make sure they're interoperable and accessible to people. Great, thank you guys for that. So um, we've had, we had several comments uh, going back to something we talked about earlier and that's the costs and just uh, some people wondering about the cost to suppliers uh, when you say something like adding, you know, another five cents, so to speak, to millions of cases, that's going to equal, you know, a pretty significant amount of money. So maybe if we, if you guys could talk a little bit more about cost of traceability. Implementation. Yeah, I, I think the cost always comes back to return on investment. If you're paying five cents per case, um, what does that save you in the long run? And I know in the food supply um, chain, a claim against what was delivered or what supposedly was delivered or something was um, not delivered on time or it's expired. The claim amount of claims, I don't have the number, Jeannie's so good with stats and stuff, but I've heard just millions of dollars in claims coming back. And if you could just half that with RFID tags with accuracy and real time visibility into the supply chain, uh, you'll get the ROI. It, it will cost money in the front, but you will save it if you implement it correctly. Yeah, so I think your cost savings and benefits probably come from three major areas. Um, one is that we've talked a lot about today is labor, and that's labor for both internal labor and then also compliance with regulation labor. Another one is having that accurate inventory, so you're not uh, doing waste. We haven't talked a lot of time today about waste. There is a lot of information out on the web about waste in the supply chain. And not only the food supply chain, but pretty much every supply chain that exists. And then the final thing is um, that provenance. Remember that report that was released that um, just for proving that your beef is grass fed, that's not carbon neutral, that's not a lot of other sustainability issues. Just failing to prove that sustainability claim that your product is grass fed raises the uh, profit back to the primary producers by 35 cents a pound. I mean, that's the largest increase that they have seen in decades. Great, thank you, Jeannie. And uh, we're about out of time. I will ask one question for all the uh, panelists to answer here. And uh, I will also put the uh, contact uh, information of everyone on here. So if you do have additional questions, please reach out to our experts or AIM. 
Uh, and that's basically, I want you guys to get out your crystal ball here and just uh, what give your thoughts on what you think might be the cutting edge AID SIGI technologies for the next generation uh, that might be utilized in this space. So uh, Amanda, I'll just let you start. Oh, I love RFID. I, I do think case level, pallet level, RFID when you're shipping in bulk. Um, the other one is machine vision um, at item level. I think our our technology there uh, could really do a lot of things. Grab a Coke and walk out the door and somebody, the machine vision, the camera knows I grabbed a Coke and I walk out the door. That's, that's kind of machine vision in my head, but I see a lot of really interesting plays with that. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Colin. Yeah, so I, I mean, I love that question because it's definitely something I feel like, I mean, all of us in our businesses, I mean, Avery, certainly same with Zebra there. I mean, we're always innovating and looking, you know, for those next technologies, you know, but I'm, I'm a proponent of sometimes teaching an old dog new tricks is, you know, just as good as, you know, the latest, you know, I mean, not, saying anything against but like AI technology you know is kind of that buzzword right now but you know sometimes adding you know new features to for instance an older technology such as RFID you know so what is what are some of those new tricks I'm talking about is you mean sensor data passive sensing data you know even though some of that passive sensors have been out for a while but there's finding ways to implement those in new applications to bring on a whole new gamut of data collection that we haven't seen prior. And it's, it's so it's, it's things like that, such as, I mean, on the topic of sensors, I mean, not only testing, you know, there's cool, um, especially from an automotive um, perspective, there's been, you know, things being done with capacitance sensing where you're sensing, you know, specific torque, specific other specs and things like that. I mean, that haven't been done with RFID that we're now starting to see. And that to me is, it is cutting edge. And I think it's really cool that we're starting to move that direction. And I think it just opens up a world and wealth of opportunity with, you know, RFID. Great. And Jeannie. So I, I'm going to have to jump on the bandwagon here and say that I'm a very strong believer in the value of brain RFID. I think um, brain RFID is just uh, getting traction within the food industry, and you're going to see a lot of adoption of brain RFID over the next few years. But to look at my um, my crystal ball, Mike, I guess what I would say is I think a couple of things that we hit on today is really going to drive the difference, and I'd like to bring up three points. The first one is the growing understanding of the difference between identification and data carrier. So Colin mentioned with the rewritable tags, this concept that you know you might have to be cognizant that you identified this package, that global identifier in a different data carrier on the same package. So understanding that there, you know, an RFID tag doesn't necessarily always mean an EPC or a UPCA barcode doesn't always mean a G10. You know, that I think is gonna be a very powerful concept. The second thing is this multi-sensor, this multi-fusion of technology. Now, I'm not against, I think I agree with uh, Amanda, the self-driving car industry has poured billions of dollars into vision technology that is now incredibly cost-effective and will be leveraged. Um, but a couple of years ago, I had an executive ask me, you know, why isn't everything going to go with vision technology? And I took my two apples, you know, that I grew my one, two, three apples, and I put them on the desk. And I said, okay, I grew this one. Tell me who grew this one by vision. So there's always going to be concept limitations, whatever technology you're talking about. So you're going to see this fusion of technologies now that we know that we can align identity across multiple data carriers. You're going to see this fusion of technology, and I absolutely agree with uh, into this multi-fusion tech uh, world, the in integration of sensors. You're going to see a proliferation of sensors over the next five to seven years, both passive. I, I have a strong belief in the value of passive sensors being tied to that globally unique identifier so the data can be leveraged across your enterprise, but I also think you're going to see a, a, a rapid uh, explanation of active sensors for a powered sensor, either by battery or by electric or by harvest. 
So I think this next uh, few years you're going to see, and we don't even know all the business models that are going to be enabled. You're going to see a rapid growth of AIDC in the food tech food space. Great, you know, very exciting times ahead. Uh, again, I want to thank Jeannie, Colin, and Amanda for your time and insights today. Really great stuff. I'd like to thank our audience for their active participation today. And again, if your question wasn't answered, please reach out to us. We'd love to answer any questions you may have about our industry. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day.